Queen. We're breaking in across uh, live now to Canberra where the Greens health spokesman Richard Di Natale is addressing the media. It's for uh, 30 years now and what we've got is a situation where the government is so out of touch with mainstream public opinion that it's come up with this public policy disaster. We've heard from the AMA, we've heard from Royal Colleges, we've heard from consumer groups, uh, unanimously, all of the same view that we have on our hands uh, one of the worst pieces of public policy uh, in the health arena ever seen. Uh, we heard from general practices now who are saying that as a combination, due to the combination of the freeze in rebates and the uh, changes to uh, rebates for non-concessional patients, that they will be charging $100 per visit for non-concessional patients. And this idea that people with a healthcare card or on a concession card are going to be protected is nonsense. Uh, we've had a practice there in Tamworth, 15 doctor practice, now looking at introducing a $60 charge for people with healthcare cards. That's what the impact of this policy is. It is friendless. So I've has rarely seen a piece of public policy that has alienated almost every single constituency in health. Uh, and it is a public policy disaster. To accredit, the Minister said she's going to consult, but you can't consult when you're going in with a predetermined outcome. And they've said, we're going to keep this reduction of $5 for non-concessional patients, and we're going to keep the freeze in indexation. That, that's a sham consultation. If you're not prepared to... Um, move away from policies that have been universally condemned from not just the AMA and doctors groups but from consumers, from academics uh, and from GPs themselves, then you're not consulting. So there's an opportunity here, there's a big opportunity here for someone to show some leadership. The Prime Minister has an opportunity, he had one at the press council, uh, he could have in that speech rather than um, waving uh, or banging the drum on terrorism and foreign ownership, really desperate measures uh, targeted at, uh, at a particular constituency. He could, he could have pressed the reset button on health policy and he didn't do that. He didn't do that. What he needs to do now is show some leadership and say we are going to start again. A and on that subject of leadership, I mean, there's been a lot of discussion about why we're in the situation we're in again uh, only a year and a half into this government's term. And I've seen a lot of analysis that talks about the 24-hour media cycle. It says how hard it is for politicians to cut through because of the pressures of the 24-hour news cycle. I've heard about volatility in the electorate. I think the Prime Minister talked about the Victorian electorate as being absent-minded. Well, here's a bit of uh, free advice. Stop looking for people to blame, right? Some advice for politicians. Start doing a better job and uh, you might be rewarded uh, by the community start doing a better job because at the moment we've got a bunch of people in this place who are careerists who have worked their way up from um, their very early years through political offices who stand for nothing and we've got a, another bunch of people who are uh, ideologues who are out of touch with mainstream public opinion who come up with thought bubbles in health that uh, fabricate a crisis around health spending again we heard today there's no crisis in healthcare. we've got a terrific health system we could make it better but we've got a terrific health system, we spend less than most comparable countries and we get much better health care. Um, so you don't fabricate a crisis to uh, further your own ends and your ends are we want to introduce co-payments because we don't think that people are entitled to universal health care. That's where this comes from. So politicians need to just do some basic things. Start listening, start looking at evidence ahead of ideology, ideology uh, and, uh, and you'll be rewarded for that. And, you'll, and take the community with you. Uh, so I, I think uh, here's, a, here's an opportunity for the Prime Minister to press reset on his uh, Prime Ministership, uh, to start again with health policy, to start talking to the crossbenchers and to other groups about where the real challenges in healthcare lie, and to ditch this idea that somehow making it harder for someone to access a GP is good health policy. It's not. Uh, this is a prescription for a two-tiered US-style health system. Uh, everybody uh, who's worked in this space, uh, academics, uh, doctors, the AMA and consumer groups agree if you're going to target uh, health care for efficiencies, you don't do it by making it harder for people to go and see a GP. I'm uh, more than happy to take some questions. In what areas of the system do you think there can afford to be efficiencies made? Uh, well, we spend a lot of money doing procedures for where there's very little value uh, gained. For example, we do a whole lot of vitamin D testing 
spend over $100 million a year, we don't get anything for that. Um, we should be looking at areas where there's wasteful spending in health. We do far too many knee arthroscopies for uh, indications where they're not necessary. Um, we spend uh, a lot of money on procedures, tests, diagnostics, for where there is very little evidence that consumers are better off. Lots of low-hanging fruit there. The countries around the world are all tackling this. In the UK, they've got an institute for clinical excellence that deals with this issue. Uh, in the US, we've got a Choosing Wisely campaign that looks at how do we get those sort of efficiencies in healthcare. That is just one of a number of areas where we can make some gains. There are a whole lot of other areas. We could uh, get better value for money for the medicines that we prescribe. Um, there's areas around scope of practice, and that's a difficult area because you come across the turf wars between the different professions, but we can look at scope of practice. There are so many areas, and I've got to tell you, there's an appetite from the medical profession, uh, from the people who are at the coalface, to engage in this space, to look at making a good system even better. Government's ignoring them at the moment. They're pursuing this line that the only way to improve the health system is making it harder for people to access it. Well, it's nonsense logic. It's nonsense logic. It's an opportunity for both the Prime Minister now and the new Health Minister to take a step back, press the reset button and start doing some of the hard yards in health policy reform. I mean, it's lazy policy. They haven't spoken to people. These, what we heard today was that groups like the AMA and the College of General Practice and almost every other group found out about these changes 10 minutes before they were announced. What sort of vacuum are these people living in that they don't think it's important to get feedback from the people who are going to be directly affected from these changes? They're lazy, they're arrogant, they are ideologues, and uh, they're not prepared to do the hard yards when it comes to areas like health policy. I've, I've met with the Health Minister and I've said to her that there are some areas where I think there's common ground. Uh, let's work on the areas where there is common ground, where we can make savings and we can improve the system. The question is whether they're going to do that or whether they're going to continue on the line that they're on, which is really uh, a prescription for a much less fair health system, but also a health system that's going to cost us long, uh, much more to run. Quite a few um, government ministers have pointed to the GP co-payment as an example of um, one of the ways in which um, Prime Minister Abbott's leadership has gone astray. Some of his so-called captain picks, captain's picks, for example. Example. Do you think there is an appetite within the government to, to scrap these changes? Oh, you only need to look at some of the public commentary. Uh, another doctor... Uh, uh, Dr Andrew Lamming uh, has already said that he thinks that the government should drop it. There are other MPs who privately have said to me they think it's bad policy. Uh, the point here is that this represents everything that's wrong with the Abbott leadership. You say one thing, you do another. Uh, you ignore the evidence. You make up your own facts. You don't talk to people. Uh, you lie about what you're going to do. And then, lo and behold, you're surprised because there's a backlash from the community and from people within your own party. Yeah, we were promised this open, transparent, accountable government. We've got the opposite. We've got a shambles at the moment. Uh, we desperately need some leadership in this place. We need some people to step up and to start looking at evidence, to put their ideological baggage to one side, uh, to engage in a real process of consultation, not what we've got at the moment, which says, oh, we're going to consult with you, but we're still committed to this $5 reduction in uh, Medicare rebates, and we're going to freeze rebates until 2018. When we heard today that the impact of that is a $100 consultation fee for a non-concessional patient and a $60 fee for someone who's got a health care card. This idea that people on low incomes are protected is nonsense. Under this policy, bulk billing will uh, decrease and people on concession cards are going to have a huge price barrier put in front of them. Uh, so there is an appetite, I'm sure, within the coalition. Um, the, the Prime Minister basically has to now make sure that he uh, um, walks the walk. Uh, he said he was going to listen. Uh, he said it was time that he brought the Australian community with him. Well, the Australian community has spoken loudly and clearly. There are people have, on his own side who have given him advice on this. Drop the co-payment, drop the freezing of indexation, and let's work together to see where we can actually make the health system more efficient and more effective. You said you spoke to the health minister about your concerns. What was her mood or her response when you made those suggestions? I, I, I made a commitment to the health minister that any discussions we had would remain private. So I'll, I'll, I'll faithfully, um, I'll, I'll respect that commitment. 
Um, all I'll say is, at least she's talking to us. And that's one thing I can say that I can't say of the previous health minister. I mean, you're going to introduce a change that is going to impact Australians in the way that the Mark 1 and Mark 2 was proposed to do, and you need the support of the Senate. You'd think a phone call might have been in order, but no. Uh, you know, we know best. Uh, we'll run this our way. Um, we, we've uh, got a strong view about how we think healthcare needs to be run in this country, and that's what you end up with. You end up with policy chaos. So, time for some grown-up government. Stop looking for other people to blame. Stop blaming the media. Stop blaming the 24-hour news cycle. Stop blaming the electorate in the volatility uh, within the Australian community. Stop calling them absent-minded. Look in your own backyard. And, um, and let's start this again. And hopefully with the health, new Health Minister we may do that. Who knows, we may have a new Prime Minister next week. Just on that though, you say there's common ground with the government. Where's the common ground? What's the common ground the Greens have with the government on health care policy? I don't want to waste money in health. I, I don't want to waste money in health. We waste money in health care at the moment. Uh, and if you're a government that talks about waste and mismanagement, I've got a range of ideas, some of which I've already put to the new Health Minister, where there is wasteful spending. Uh, we've got a good health system. I don't want to buy into this idea that the system's in crisis. But we can make it better. And one way we can make it better is to stop spending money on things that don't add any value to the uh, consumer or to the system generally. So there are areas there. If you're so concerned about waste and mismanagement, well, why don't you engage in a conversation with us about how we can improve that? And the medical profession are open to that. They want to have that conversation. We've heard that today, that there are things that we can do in that space. But if you've got your ideological blinkers on and your ideological blinkers say one thing, uh, you've, got to make, you've got to put a price signal in, you've got to make it harder for people to see a GP, that's the way we fix it, well, you're not going to get anywhere. You're going to make the system less fair, more expensive because people end up in the hospital emergency departments, GPs whack up their fees and no one gets uh, any benefit out of that. It's, it's, it is one of the most disastrous pieces of public policy ever embarked upon in the health space. We need to press reset or to start again. This morning we heard from the Royal College of GPs who said that they had heard that there was only a two-week consultation window with the Health Minister. The Health Minister's denied this. Why do you think that two-week figure's come up? And have you heard um, about any sort of limitations in terms of consultation? Uh, I haven't personally. Uh, as I said, I, uh, I made an approach to the Health Minister to so say it'd be interesting talking to her. She took that up to her credit uh, and we had a, a, an open and frank conversation. In terms of what she does with the other health groups, um, if it's a genuine consultation, the first thing you do is you say, we're going to take off the reduction in the rebate, we're going to stop the freeze on the Medicare rebates, we're going to start again. That's what a genuine consultation looks like. They haven't done that yet. There's still time. Uh, there's no way you'll get this done in two weeks. If that indeed is um, as it uh, seems to be, uh, then, then all that does is, uh, is, is mean that what we've got is a sham consultation process. Um, I haven't heard anybody else say that, so, uh, so we'll wait and see how it, how it transpires. And most of the other doctors' groups have said they've been really happy that, um, that the Minister has actually approached them, has listened quite well. Um, are you hopeful that the consultation process will yield results? Uh, I'm always hopeful. I'm, I'm always hopeful in this place. If you didn't have hope, you wouldn't be here. Um, do I think it's going to yield a result? Well, up until this point, the two most controversial aspects of the Medicare package uh, are still on the table. We're still going to pay GPs $5 less for an ordinary consult and we're going to freeze rebates. We heard today, I mean, loudly and clearly, from GPs, not from, not from the AMA, not from any other interest groups, we had a panel of GPs today who said, I will no longer be able to bulk bill my concessional card patients. Uh, the fee we're looking at introducing within a year is a $60 upfront fee for patients who were previously bulk billed. That's the end of bulk billing in Tamworth for that practice, 15 doctors. Uh, we heard that for non-concessional patients, we're talking about a $100 fee. Forget Barnaby Joyce's $100 lamb roast. We're talking about a $100 fee now to go and see a GP. That's what we're talking about. Um, that's not fantasy land. That is the evidence provided before the Senate committee. Um, and that is, as I said, that is bad health policy doesn't save anyone any money. Puts the costs on the state governments, people end up in hospitals, simple problems become much more expensive problems, worse for the consumer, worse for the taxpayer. On the Medical Research Future Fund, Brian Aller said this morning it should be funded with the $15 billion already found in savings um, and not through the co-payment. What's your view? Should the Future Fund get up? Should it 
be brought forward or should it be dropped entirely? No, no, my view is that the Future Fund's a good idea. It's one of the few good ideas the government had. The, the great tragedy here was that it linked it to a, a terrible piece of uh, health policy with the co-payment. The first thing they've got to do is uncouple the uh, Future Fund from the co-payment and they've got to look at alternative uh, uh, ways to, to fund the Future Fund. Um, I think there are savings to be made in healthcare. I've said that already. I think there's some, uh, there are some opportunities to really look at how we get better value for money. I mean, there are other areas, a bit more difficult, but trying to reward GPs not just for the number of people they see, but for, for good outcomes, making sure that people are getting their blood sugar checked, their blood pressure checked, and having the right referrals, all the sort of things that we know keep people out of hospital. There are ways of doing that, but it's, it's hard yards. We had a health minister previously who didn't seem interested in it. Thought that had this thought bubble about a co-payment. Didn't talk to anybody about it. Didn't talk to a, you know the crossbenchers whose vote you think he might be counting on, and then expected this thing to fly. It was just it was a shocking, shocking approach to a government who promised transparency, accountability, and grown-up government, and they haven't delivered on any of those things. And again, I just say um, it's not that hard. Stop looking for other people to blame. Be honest. Tell people what you're going to do follow the evidence and take people with you and, and you know you'll be rewarded for that but we just haven't seen it we haven't seen it from this government and we haven't seen it in this place for, for far too long richard di natale there the uh, health spokesperson for 